So welcome to day two of Men's Health Week and the second in our series of lunchtime men's health check-ins, check-in number two, um, the topic of which is how to help a mate. And we've got a fantastic uh, speaker with us today to, to lead this session. Joining us is Jonathan Bedlow. I've got a long list of things that Jonathan's done. I think I first met Jonathan over 10 years ago at the National Men's Health Gathering in Brisbane, when at the time he was a board member of the Australian Men's Health Forum. He went on to be one of our presidents as well. Uh, and he's best known uh, in our sector for being uh, one of the lead people at Men's Resources Tasmania, which is a peak organisation for men's health uh, across the glorious state of Tasmania. And there's much more besides. Uh, he used to work in the Department of Health in Tassie, so he knows health from both the community side and the government side. He has a, a bit of a hinterland too as an adventure kayaker. Uh, he's a great family man, got a beautiful family and grown-up kids. Um, very involved in men's work, setting up men's sheds uh, across Tasmania, involved in, in groups like the Tasmen um, Gathering. So really engaged in lots of different aspects of men's health, but also a really uh, skilled uh, facilitator and trainer in suicide prevention. Uh, so he brings that skill set to this conversation, as well as really understanding what it takes to work well with blokes. Um, Jonathan's a personal friend, but also a real great professional colleague as well. He's been my boss when he was the president. Uh, we've worked <laughs> side by side, uh, particularly with our partnership with Suicide Prevention Australia. So you're yeah. blushing, are yeah. you? This is, you should have sent me the biography. It would have been quicker. <laughs> there you go. I'm nearly there. Um, so... Um, We've worked side by side on a project with Suicide Prevention Australia called Doing It Tough, which is a New South Wales based website that provides support services, links to support services uh, for, for men and boys doing it tough in New South Wales. Uh, and out of that work came this particular resource, something that um, uh, Jonathan led on developing a couple of years ago, which is our Doing It How to Help a Mate Doing It Tough guide. So, if that's is that, is that an okay build up, Jonathan? Oh, I don't know if I can live up to all that, but anyway. Yeah, and, 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 he's, and he's an all right bloke. So I don't want to build up the expectation too much. He's not an OAM though, so, you know. No, you know. thank goodness you're here, Ian. Yeah, so I will hand over to uh, you into the capable hands of, of, of Jonathan uh, Bedlow. Thanks for being here, Jonathan. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, zooming in from... The, from Lutrawitta, Tasmania, um, the land of the Palawa Pakana people, um, and the privilege to be enjoying their lands down here in Tassie. So um, I'll just share my screen briefly. I've got some slides to um, take us through along the way, but certainly want to try and make this interactive. So I've got a few quest questions built in to the proceedings. So please do feel free to chime in on the chat and um, uh, jump in off the, on the microphone as well. Um, obviously, we've got to manage that with the number of people on the call, but um, I'm sure we'll be able to hear from a few people along the way. Um, so, yeah, we're focusing today on how to help a mate doing it tough. Um, and really, this is about, yes, suicide prevention or intervention was sort of the motivator for putting this booklet together and these conversations. But really, it's about um, just anybody that's struggling, um, particularly men, obviously, we're focusing on on supporting men, but really any man that's just struggling with the challenges that he might be dealing with, um, this, the format of this conversation should hopefully provide some guidance and help. Um, obviously, before we do get started, um, good to just acknowledge the topic that we're on to today uh, and that we can bring up some difficult conversations to, focused on suicide, other aspects of mental health challenges and things. And so really just want to encourage you to look after yourselves. Um, obviously, being on Zoom, we can't, um, you know, tap you on the shoulder and check in and make sure you're okay. So we need you to step up and look after yourselves in that space. We do have, we are available for a bit of a chat afterwards. Um, the best thing would be to 
message us, Glenn, Kim, or myself uh, through the chat, and we'd be happy to give you a call afterwards. Or, or um, so leave us your phone number if you do do a private message. Um, but either way, grab a few extra minutes at, at, during the day to just you know be mindful, look after yourself, take care of yourself. Okay. So essentially our talk is going to step us through these uh, these subjects, spotting the signs, how do we actually identify when somebody's struggling, uh, a little bit about how we have the talk, what are some, uh, some language that we can use, how do we talk to our mates, uh, how do we talk to the men in our lives in a way that they can hear and that they can connect. Uh, we've got a simple model for how we do that using the ABC approach. Very innovative, I'm sure. You know, never come across any sort of ABC acronym before, but there you go. We're leading the way with that one. And then, of course, the question about suicide, which we know is so important. Um, how do we actually ask that question in a way that uh, is going to give us a, a, an accurate answer? and that's going to keep our friends, our mates engaged in the conversation as well. All right. So first question, really, what are some of the signs? So we've got some thinking, and I should highlight, um, maybe I'll just come off share briefly, just to highlight that we've got this little booklet Hopefully you can see that, that it's um, been produced by AMHF. That's weird. I've got a sign come up saying I'm speaking in a foreign language of Spanish. I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Hopefully not. Hopefully you can understand my, my English. So, yes, a great little resource that's available from AMHF. And that's essentially the booklet that reflects what we're talking about in the conversation today. So when it comes to signs that a mate's doing it tough, what are some of those signs? Can anybody just throw a comment in the chat or somebody like to come off mute and give us a few hints and tips as to what some warning signs might be that someone's doing it tough? <laughs> I apologise, I did the joke there, Jonathan, but what got yeah. missed was Adam said that signs are not engaging socially. Do inglese è perfecto. Um, yes. DJ James says, uh, withdrawn. Ian Westmoreland is saying, pulling out of events. Yeah, so withdrawing and isolating, very much a key, uh, a key thing. And particularly if we notice that's a change from who someone normally is. If they're normally with, withdrawn and isolated and really introverted, well, that's who they are, but it's the change that we might notice in that area. Yeah. Yep. Anger, out of character behaviour, and that, that's probably a good sort of overarching way to look at it, that the changes in people's behaviours um, from who they normally are. Appearance. Yeah, all, yeah, all of a sudden they could be bubbly. They've, they've made a decision and they... And uh, yes. it's it, it, so I think the change in behaviour is crucial. It's not just necessarily that something appears to be wrong. Absolutely. So it's not always that, that um, things have gone downhill. It may be someone who's been seemingly down or introverted or quiet for a long time and they, they're up and, uh, yes, potentially have made a decision about how they're going to deal with the challenges um, through possible suicide or something like that. That could be a sign in and of itself. Great. Drinking, yep, heavy drinking, relationship issues absolutely so let me jump back on to share my screen again all right so um all of those things are bang on and we've got a bit of a summary here and i really like the way this gets summed up into these three sort of categories Something's happened. So there may be some events in the person's life. Um, he's had some relationship challenges, work troubles, stress, financial issues, obviously, could be another big factor. So something's happened. Um, and we may well be aware of those things ourselves, or it may come up in conversation. We could, we could ask, what's happened to you? 
Uh, maybe that something's changed in their behavior, in their demeanor. They're not enjoying life. They're withdrawing in the ways we've we've discussed. They could be using drugs or alcohol a bit more, taking more risks, or or just that might be more about being careless with how they look after themselves. And then something's not right. And I, I like this as well because it gives us, I think, license to think about our own intuitions and our own gut feeling. We've just got that gut feeling that something's not right with this person, uh, with our mate, and um, they need something more than just, uh, the, than just the usual, are you okay? So it could be um, we pick up, pick up on that through that lack of self-care, the feelings and expressions of hopelessness, helplessness and the like. So really good summary there to think about, um, you know, how to identify those warning signs. So if, yes, something's happened, something's changed, something's not right, um, our mate might need some help. So uh, we've identified those invitations, the messages that have come to us from our mate. And now we're thinking, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Before we get to that, how easy is it, do you think, for people to reach out when they might be doing it tough? Like we hear a lot of messages, if only men would talk more. Um, and that's great in a sense, you know, it's good for men to open up. Um, but is there another way to think about this? Any thoughts? So maybe reaching out is a challenge. I'm not sure. I can't see the chat anymore, Glenn, if somebody okay, can. So, yeah. So uh, Richard's saying, yes, not easy. Uh, Adam, not easy because of the way men respond. Um, Russell's saying we need to step in, not wait for men to reach out. Yeah. Uh, Adam acknowledging that actually sometimes the way we respond is, hey, you know, is the, is the toughen up thing, which obviously yeah. makes it even harder uh, yeah. to reach out. So, yeah. Right. So absolutely. So, so yes, in a sense, part of the motivation for this whole guide and this webinar is the idea that when, when you're struggling, it can be hard to reach out. So we need the people around us to reach in and check in. Um, and certainly if we pick up on those signs, the words that people say to say, Hey, uh, I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm doing it tough. Uh, we need to pick up on that and reach in and um, ask those questions. So where do we go from here? Well, to the next slide. So we've got our ABC plan, which we're going to step through in just a moment. Um, all about asking and listening, obviously, and then building a plan and then connecting people to help. But before we get to, to that, to actually enacting that plan, it's good to maybe have a think about ourselves. And are we actually in a good space to, to be the person to help right now? So first of all, you know, just a brief moment to think, am I okay? Am I in a good space? Have I got the time? Have I got some resources maybe to uh, support me having this conversation? Um, from there, assuming we are ready, then thinking a little, thinking a little bit about how we want to have the conversation, where and when might we do it. Um, it's not necessarily a conversation we want to have, you know, standing on the street corner on the, um, in passing. We might want to grab somewhere, grab a park bench, um, go and grab a coffee somewhere, have, have a, a time and a place where you can have that interaction and have that conversation without uh, being interrupted or being overheard by other people. Possibly going for a walk shoulder to shoulder. And we know the whole men's sheds uh, organisations that are very premised on that idea of shoulder to shoulder, that the guys connect better side by side sometimes, not always, but for a lot of guys that does make sense and, and putting the problem sort of out in front of you or off to the side and talking about that together. And then have a think about what are you going to say? Um, you know, try and get your language and just a few moments to think through what am I going to say? What, why do I want to have this conversation? I think if we know and can identify for ourselves why we want to have that conversation, 
it, it it's actually food for the conversation itself. We can express why we're concerned, why we want to ask these questions to our mate, and and that can be part of breaking the ice and um, engaging them in that chat. So have a quick practice of what you want to say, um, and go from there. So we'll move into the action plan, starting with A for ask and listen. So how are we going to start this conversation? I'd love to hear from you some of your thoughts about how we might engage our mates in this conversation. What in conversation, what sort of thing might we start off with? And, and Jonathan, while we're getting some answers uh, to that, um, mm. really, a good point here from Richard about you know what you were just saying about getting in the right place. So Richard says, if you're not in a good place yourself, mm. still able to help someone else. And he actually says, sometimes in leadership roles, you don't have a lot of choice. So your thoughts on that? First? Yeah, great. Good question. Thank you for that. Um, absolutely. If we're not in a good place ourselves, can we just find somebody else who can have that conversation without necessarily disclosing a lot of detail? We need to manage people's privacy, obviously, but we can let, if you're in a leadership role, maybe there's an HR person, um, people and culture person, or maybe there's uh, a health and safety officer who might have some training and have a few skills in a, how to have these conversations. Perhaps you've got some assist trained staff um, who, you know, people trained up through the Living Works training. Uh, these days, there's more and more people. And, and I'd say if your organisation doesn't have a couple of go-to people who are skilled up to have the conversations, I'd really encourage you to invest in, in, in doing that. But absolutely, if you're not in a good place yourself, um, there's nothing wrong with handballing that to somebody else, finding hopefully the right person who can connect and has maybe some level of connection with that person already. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Adam says, um, in terms of your the moving on, next question, about mm. preparing, choose the right environment. Yes, absolutely. So um, environment, you know, can say so much in terms of where we are. Um, and I think let's let's not get too caught up in, in the right environment. You know, if we really need to have the conversation, we need to have the conversation. And I think we should prioritise that. But, but, but yes, absolutely. Um, if you can, yeah, find a quiet spot um, away from interruptions and the like, that that's going to be helpful. Okay, no more, no more comments at the moment. Unless you want to call for some more comments. Any, so I'm thinking about language. What are some of the what some of the words we might use to to start this conversation to connect with our mate? So. You can we can use the um, you know the things that we've identified the warning signs that we've picked up on. Perhaps we could use those to frame up or initiate a conversation. Yeah, here's a something great from uh, Travis here, Jonathan. Mm. Uh, we can start by saying um, that the reason we're having this conversation is that we care, and yeah. we can notice a change in, in behaviour. Exactly. So I've noticed. Hey. John, I'm worried about you. I've noticed that and whatever it is you've noticed. I've noticed that you're withdrawing, you're isolating. I've noticed that you haven't been getting together with, with the guys recently. Uh, I know that you've gone through that separation. I'm wondering how you're travelling. Yeah. So, again, probably sort of three or four catchphrases built on, on the warning sign. So I know something's happened. I've noticed thinking about the behavior change and I'm concerned thinking about the things that um, that don't feel right. And here's a few examples. So sounds like you're doing it tough. What's going on for you? Um, often hear, we often hear the phrase, um, how are you feeling? And that's great, a useful um, phrase, but I think for a lot of guys, it's less about how they're feeling and it's more about the situation they're dealing with. So what's going on for you? Tell me what's happening. That's sometimes a more useful question. 
Um, I'm listening. Keep going. Tell me more. Um, looks like you're struggling, mate. So, you know, we're really just talking grassroots, down to earth language between two mates. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be clinical. Um, it's just normalizing conversation that we might have in any other way with our mate. But we're starting to focus in on the fact that we're struggling, uh, that the fellas struggling. Anything anybody wants to add to that before we move on? Yeah, got a suggestion here from Ian, um, just in terms of uh, a, a little a little tip. Um, he says, Ian says, sometimes I ask, how are you going out of 10? So, you know, asking someone to rate themselves out of 10. Yeah. Can I just expand on that, uh, Graham? Yeah. So uh, I struggle a bit with the, are you okay? Yes or no. And and it's just, it just doesn't lead anywhere. Often mm. people asking them, maybe don't care that much and the people answer it don't but if if i was to ask someone how are you going out of 10 if they say let's say they say two or three wow you know what what made you give that it leads into an, another question and yeah. and if it's nine oh, brilliant what's going so well for you so i i yeah. my experience is i generally get an, an accurate response to that and then it leads to a question which maybe gets down to that. But I, I like your questions as well. But that's just something that works for me yeah. rather than uh, I'd say I don't like, are you okay? Absolutely. And, you know, that, that idea of measurement, you know, I think relates well for men particularly as well. And it's useful for us as well as for the the fellow we're supporting. Yeah. Another Thanks, great, yeah. And another great question here, Jonathan, which I think speaks to a lot of people's uh, concerns when having these conversations so it's, it's a what if question. Well, yeah, what if I, well, I I do all this, and then the bloke says, "Well, you know, they don't come back truthfully. They avoid. They say, no, no, I'm fine. I'm all right. No, there's nothing, nothing wrong.' What you, you so how how do we deal with that mm. when we can sense something isn't right, but the feedback yeah. we're getting when we ask is, no, everything's okay.' Yeah, great question. And so my response to that would be. It seems like possibly there's not a lot of trust there yet. Um, obviously, we know there's lots of stigma out there. There's a lot of fear um, in the community about, you know, naming up how we're actually travelling, particularly when it comes to suicide and, and other mental health challenges as well. And so, yeah, we, we've, got to, we've got to break through that. This is not necessarily a two or three minute conversation. It, it needs a bit more time. So... I'd say let's persist and just keep connecting, right? Just uh, keep trying to engage um, at the level that you that your relationship allows, um, and possibly down the track. And certainly, I think the way the rest of the talk goes is going to pick up on how we can continue the conversation. But um, just keep going, push through. And, and can I offer something here, Jonathan, as well? Yeah, of course. The way that you're structuring these questions is a real, is a real subtle, important point here. Mm. You're not saying um, you're not right. There's something wrong with you. You're, no, you're, you're right. get over here. You're saying I've noticed. Yeah, absolutely. Something different. I'm concerned about you. So mm. this, it's not like it doesn't it doesn't occur like an accusation, and that means that defenses can drop. And That's so a, right. lot it, a lot of it is how is how we open the question and and how, how we listen, because if we just open the question and make and, and, and make the observation over here and make it clear that it's because we're coming from a place of care, hmm. it opens a space where trust can start to happen. So sometimes it is about how we ask the question as well. Absolutely. And as Russell here says, uh, sometimes I say he's obviously had this experience. Sometimes he says, okay, yeah, you know, I hear that. And your eyes are telling me that there is something. Hmm. So there's little ways we can just keep nudging and chipping, which creates the space for the, uh, for the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I like about that, that I language of saying I'm concerned is that it's, it's our stuff. They, um, the other person can't kind of deny that because that's our experience we're talking about. And so when we own those concerns and and own the things that we've observed, um, other people can't really deny that. Um, yeah. So yeah, conti continue the conversation, persist. There's a few more hints and thoughts on the next slide here as well. So yes, name up what it is that we're concerned about. And I think that's, that's really key. Ex explain why it is we're concerned. 
Um, try and ask open questions as well. So um, obviously open questions are about ex getting the person to expand on how they're traveling. So they might come back and say, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I'm fine and try and gloss over it. And um, so we can ask some open questions. Well, tell me, tell me what's going so well. That's great. I'm glad things are going well. Um, I thought these other things weren't going so well. Tell me, tell me about that. Um, listening is really key and trying not to judge. Um, this is the thing and this is why for a lot of guys naming up that they're having thoughts of suicide or that they're really struggling is so difficult is because uh, we're worried about the judgment and how we're going to be judged on the other side of the conversation. And so the more we can do to, and, we, and let's acknowledge we may feel judgments, we may um, feel judgmental about the way a person's behaving or carrying on, but if we can hold those judgments lightly and just really be there and listen um, and try not to judge and also try not to jump in and fix. And this is, this is in a way really helpful to us as carers because we don't have to fix the person. It's not our job to find solutions necessarily to the challenges that, that they're facing. Indeed, um, you know, that's a bigger conversation that's going to go well beyond this conversation. Um, but even in the even in the immediate term, we don't have to you know provide the ways to get through this situation. All right. So a um, few other hints I've got here in my notes. Seems like you've been drinking a lot more than usual lately. That's been my experience. Um, do you think that, you know, checking in, sharing our experience and then asking the other person's perspective on that? Um, what's been going on? What's happened to you, et cetera, et cetera. So open questions, trying to get, um, our mate to talk and share as well. So once we've done a bit of that, um, uh, we've opened the conversation. Hopefully our mate is engaged. If, you know, that first uh, section under A for ask and listen might take quite a bit of time and that might be as far as you get in some ways. It's just, it's, a, it's an extended conversation to check in on how people are traveling. But once we get to a, a point where, okay, we've identified there are some challenges, uh, we can look at B, B and building a plan. And a key for me around this is building a plan together. Like I was saying just before, we don't have to have all the solutions and the answers. Um, we can build a plan together. So what might you say to initiate building a plan together? What sorts of comments questions could you ask to look at building a plan? Uh, one of the questions I ask is, um, do you have a plan to harm yourself? So you get some background knowledge that they actually have ideations and what those ideations might be. Yep, absolutely. So that's sort of relating to the question around uh, are you thinking of suicide? And we're going to come to that specifically um, shortly. So we're thinking sort of more broadly about somebody who might be generally just doing it tough. Um, but yes, no harm in asking that question. The only thing I would say is if we are actually concerned about suicide and we're wanting, uh, wanting to ask about suicide, let's really name it up and ask about suicide, ending your life, etc. If we talk about harm, um, you know, for some people, they they uh, they may well be intending on harming themselves to such a degree that they're going to end their life, but we're not actually finding that out. Or in their mind, it might be, no, they're not going to harm themselves at all. They're going to end their life. So, there's you know, when there's room for um, interpretation in, in those questions, uh, it's good if we can try to narrow it down a bit more. But we'll, but it's a great point. So thanks for raising it, and we'll we'll address the suicide question shortly. But just thinking about making that plan. Any other comments coming through or in the chat, maybe? Okay, I've got from Merv. Give space to let them come up with a plan. 
Murph says he often has uh, some blank paper to hand and a pen so they can draw out ideas together. Some mm -hmm. guys work better visually in his experience, he says. I think Merv, obviously someone who's out working in the community with a lot of blokes there. He's got his pen and paper and doing the visuals. Uh, Travis is saying, let's have a chat and work out what we can do to help you through this challenge and get you back to good health. Mm -hmm. um, Ian's asking about who's on your team and do you have a safe plan? Uh, so that covers a couple of points there that I think you're going to come to, actually, um, Jonathan. Right. And just want yeah. to acknowledge to uh, Tim. Uh, I'm going to come back to your point, Tim, as it's a really good one, but it's just slightly off topic at the second. We'll come back to it. Um, Russell says, I tend not to use the word plan. I talk about what is needed in the next five minutes, mm -hmm. in the next hour, in the next day. So what do you need now? What do you need in the next hour? What do you need? What do you need tomorrow? So it's uh, yeah, breaking it down. Right. And, and getting really good and practical you know, um, and looking at time frames, and I think that's really valid, fantastic. So we've got a couple of examples here. Um, what can we do to help you tackle this? How can I help? Um, what's one thing that can get you back on track? What's worked in the past? And I really like that one because, you know, we've, we've all been through challenges at different stages in the past, and we um, often have resources and, and and thoughts around what's going to help. We just need somebody to prompt us with that. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's what's worked in the past. Um, you know, when, we, when we're doing it tough, um, sometimes we, we don't think as clearly as we, we might otherwise. So getting a few of those prompts can be really helpful. All right. A couple more tips there. So listening out for... Um, that shifting gear, right? So we're, we've picked up on the, you know, the, the, the fellas hopefully shared a little bit about the fact they're not traveling that well. Um, they responded to our observations and confirmed them, confirmed them or otherwise. Um, but again, it's not our job to fix those things. We can just um, step in, listen, ask some more open questions we could share a little bit about how we've dealt with challenges in the past. Uh, we need to be mindful that we don't get into our own story with that. Um, you know, it's so easy to jump in. The, oh, yep. Yeah. When I went through my divorce, I went to such and such and, um, uh, you know, ended up in a, you end up in a big conversation talking about yourself rather than the other person. So there's no harm in sharing a little bit of our own lived experience and, and what worked for us. But as long as we come back around to, do you think that would be useful for you? Something like that. Yeah. Any comments or questions on, on action B before we move on to C and connecting to help? Yeah, a couple of things, uh, Jonathan. Um, firstly, I think we should definitely cover this. Jess Byrne has asked, can women help in this scenario too? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, of course. Uh, we need all the help we can get. And I guess what we're suggesting with this webinar and with this little toolkit is just some little hints and tips that maybe help um, to connect with men in, in ways that men want to be connected with. And in part, this is in response to the fact that we know uh, a lot of suicide prevention services are not necessarily reaching men as well as they could. We know um, a lot of services reach far more women than they do men. And with the suicide numbers, as we know, men are uh, accounting for about three out of four suicides. We think we need to change the approach a little bit to address men specifically. But who does the approaching? really doesn't matter. Um, I would just add, just be yourself as well within that. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think authenticity is a really key part of creating that connection and building that trust. Yeah, you know, great stuff, Jonathan. Really important to emphasise uh, this. Uh, we put a lot of focus on, on, on reaching out to men and we put a lot of focus on giving men the skills to help their mate. And that's because we want more men involved in suicide prevention. But because we want more men involved doesn't mean to say we want less women involved. We need as many people on the, in this game as possible. And 
some of the best people working in men's health are women. I think uh, up in Queensland, where I am, uh, we've got uh, Mary O'Brien, for example, who runs a fantastic rural pro pro project, Are You Bogged Mate? Uh, it doesn't make a difference to those uh, those rural blokes that she's a woman, but she's a rural woman who speaks their language. Mm -hmm. So, and this is about this is this is a lot about what we're talking about is is speaking people's language. It, it really helps whether if we can if we can talk in a way that connects um, with them. But we need men and women doing that one hundred percent. And thank you for being here, Jess. And you've made an extra comment: suicide prevention for men in Australia. Is a huge problem we need to do better so clearly you're an ally and an advocate for men which is great to hear you're very welcome thank you for all you're obviously doing already mm -hmm. um jonathan yeah. uh, moving on from that as well i had a comment earlier from tim i wasn't quite sure where to put it um but i'm just gonna i'm just gonna read it out and see if we can un unpick this a little bit uh, mm -hmm. i think this might be a good space here when we're talking about building a plan and and thinking about how much we can help uh, someone when we're building that plan to what extent can we be the person giving the help and to what extent do we need to build a team um, mm. uh, Tim asks how are you able to engage um, without bringing your friends and family down with you with your own issues so I'm not quite sure whether this Tim's talking here from the helping perspective or the or the or the being help perspective it's not entirely clear um, mm. but Tim says I often find my support group feeding off myself and I worry in the regard I'm bringing them down with me. So any, any thoughts on that? And, and Tim, if you're on and want to add to that, you can do, and, and, and there's no pressure to do that either, Tim. Oh, but really thank you for uh, for that question. And but both, Tim's saying both, yeah, uh, like I'm helping others, uh, but I also you know need support myself. It's a two-way process. So some thoughts on that, Jonathan? Yeah, look, um, as as helpers um and we and we go through our own struggles at times as well i i think um if we can get proactive on our own self care um that would be my first comment is let's not wait until we're facing challenges before we enact looking after ourselves really well i think you know we're we're living in a pretty challenging world there's a lot of pressures going on going on um, and so we need to step up the level of self-care that we actually practice. Um, and, and then I would also say, um, let's not, let's, um, can I say respectfully, not worry about being a burden. Um, you know, I think men can take on this idea that we're a burden and people would be better off without us. That's not the case. And overwhelmingly, people report after they've lost loved ones um, uh, that, you know, they wish they'd known, they wish they had been able to do more. And so um, I'm not sure if that's helpful or not, but I think certainly in this space where we're obviously focusing on men and with uh, a lot of men on the call, let's try and uh, break down the stigma around reaching out for help because it's still a positive message and we should reach out for help. Anything you want to add there, Glenn? Or anybody uh, else? I, I I don't. I support what you've said and I just want to thank Tim for such a great open question for sharing that. Mm. Um, yeah. and, and just a quick point from... You, you are, and, and Tim's giving us a thank you in the chat box as well. So thanks, Tim. And I, I, I'm going to abbreviate this little message from from Bruce here. Um, he's he's you know went through his own struggles himself about eight nine years ago, uh, and he found that a PTS, PTD, PTSD resurrected in Queensland. A very helpful course. He says he's now doing great and helping others. So thanks, Bruce. It's an example of how people can go through stuff, do their own healing, carry on supporting, carry on doing the care for themselves, but also taking their experience to help and support others, um, which is, you know, that's the, that's the power of peer support, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, we have something, to, we've all been through struggles and we have something specific to offer to others who've been through the same struggles as us. Um, for me, big, big one in my life was going through separation as a separated dad. And, and, and I, I try and help blokes from all sorts of backgrounds going through all sorts of struggles, but I find I'm, I just happen to be really, really good at helping separated dads because I get it and they know that I get it. And it makes that that's peer support. Mm. That's what makes a difference for some guys. Mm. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Great point. And, and in a sense, that's a bit of a caveat on, on what I was saying around not getting into our own story. And that's, you know, our own lived experience is, is valid and valuable 
Um, so, so certainly don't let it, don't let that idea stop you from sharing your own experience to some degree as well. All right. So we're moving on to C to connect to help. So the question to you here now is what would you say to help him connect to the help he needs? What are the questions you might ask or statements you might make, um, suggestions you might make along these lines? Love to hear a few thoughts. One might be, when do you want me to check in and see how you're going? That might be one example. What I think have you mentioned already this? What works in the past? What's worked for you before? I think that's a phrase. Yeah, that's... that that sort of came up in the building the plan mm. section as well. Yeah, so that would be another one. Yeah, so are there support services or a GP or a psych that you've connected to before? Or yep. spoke, yeah, or you know about that friends used or something like that, family members used. That's right. And let's think as well about, um, you know, there might be mental health challenges that the person that our mate's dealing with, but it might be other things like uh, financial issues, uh, relationship issues. And so the services that relate to those specific areas are also really important um, to flag up um, if we're looking for ideas. And are we, are we just talking about support services here or are we also talking about um, other, other, other friends? that you can talk to or stuff like that yeah so i think i think it's good to think of two lenses one being professional services which may be medical or maybe those other ones that i was mentioning but then also informal and sort of uh social supports so whether that's mates whether it's sporting clubs uh community houses men's sheds um, all of those other social supports that we know are so important and val valuable and in a sense can fill the rest of our lives up as well. So, you know, you go to see a professional, you go to see a psychologist, that's an hour in the week. What about the rest of the week? Um, you know, it's actually through those other social supports that so much um, uh, real change or real support can actually be felt. Not to devalue the important place of psychologists at all, but, you know, let's be real. It's only a, an hour or two session at a time, and, and it's actually about the rest of the week that we need to be thinking of as well. So we've got a couple more comments there, uh, probably some in the chat, I'd imagine. But, yeah, let's look online together what, what might help. And certainly if you're in New South Wales, you could check out the Doing It Tough website that, um, that's, uh, we, that Glenn mentioned earlier, a fantastic resource put together between Australian Men's Health Forum and Suicide Prevention Australia to try and capture those grassroots services in particular, the men's sheds, the men's tables, uh, the Mr. Perfect Barbecues and the like that are happening all around the state. And uh, even if you're not in New South Wales, I, I recommend checking it out anyway, because there'll be many of those services will have local chapters or local groups uh, in other states around the country as well. And who else could you talk to? Who else can you share these challenges with? Do you have a couple of mates? Um, that you're able to share these these uh, situations with. A couple more top tips. So, yep, focusing on, remember, more than just the mental health side of things, but also money, family, booze, alcohol and other drugs, etc. cetera. Uh, so finding the services that connect into those particular things. Um, but then let's think, what if he doesn't want help? Um, you know, this can still be a, a reality for some people. Um, and for me, the response to this is just let's just ask why. Why is it that the person doesn't want help? They may still have all that fear and uh, stigma um, that they're fighting against. Uh, it might be about financial worries. You know, how can they afford to go and see a GP? It might be about access that they actually can't get into a GP or to a counsellor. Um, and I would suggest that 
if we ask the question why, we'll probably be able to find some solutions in response. And one I would uh, highlight is EAP. So whilst e employment assistance pr um, programs, which most employers have in place, they're not all perfect, but they are generally accessible and uh, they can be a really good short-term stopgap for, for guys. And they're not focused only on mental health. They can be focused on all sorts of, you know, whatever it is the employee wants to go and chat with them about. Uh, so they can be a good uh, short-term, even medium-term uh, part of the solution. All right, mindful of time. Um, so let's get to that, uh, that question. So should we ask about suicide and if so, when? So uh, I think we can, we've already sort of stated that, yes, we should ask about suicide and um, this isn't to say we should always ask about suicide. I think if we've if we've picked up the conversation and we've engaged with our mate and we've identified what the issues are and we feel like it's it's moving, you know, this we're finding some resolution together and we're creating a plan. Um, maybe maybe we don't need to ask about suicide. But if there's any doubt whatsoever, let's just be reassured that there's no harm in asking a question. Uh, you're not going to lead anyone to think about suicide if they haven't thought about it. Um, you're just asking a simple question. Any thoughts, comments on that before we go into how we might do that? Just a quick comment from Russell about language, which is great. Sometimes the word help itself can make a man feel helpless. Mm -hmm actually saying you need help can often make them feel helpless perhaps another way is to reinforce that you're walking alongside him as 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 he will in turn yeah. walk alongside others nicely framed russell yeah yeah and nice. sort of reaffirming that yes talking about help can sometimes make men feel helpless so it's uh yeah yeah and we could even frame it as hey it's okay to need help i needed help yeah, so let's try and change the language possibly, and 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 reduce the stigma around that if, if uh, if that's if that's going to be helpful. But absolutely, um, language around all this stuff, you know, it's subtle, but um, it's great to hear some of those other ideas of things that work. So essentially, in terms of how to ask the question, really, what we'd say is let's name up what what it is we've observed or why we're concerned. Um, and then link that to the idea that sometimes people who go through those situations, they think about suicide, and then we can ask the question directly. So, hey, mate, you know, I know you've been going through this tough time with the separation, and uh, you talked about how you're really leaning on the booze at the moment. Um, I'm really worried about you, and I, I know sometimes when people are in this situation, they think about suicide. Is that something you've been thinking about? Are you thinking of ending your life or killing yourself. So we're going to, we really want to use the language of ending your life, killing yourself, suicide. It, it, it might feel a bit, a, a bit brutal from where we're sitting, um, but that way we all know what we're talking about. And we're actually starting to address the stigma that's out there around the topic. If we can show that we're comfortable talking about it, even if we're, maybe not comfortable, we might be uncomfortable. Can we choose to be uncomfortable? Uh, sorry, can we choose to be comfortable with being uncomfortable around this conversation and actually um, lean in? Probably we're in a better space than the other fellow we're talking to. Any thoughts, any other language that people um, use around this conversation? Yeah, I'm just going to jump in, Jonathan. We've got we've got about five or six minutes left just to flag that up, um, yeah. uh, and I'm going to offer you uh, my 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 favourite framing of this, which is uh, is to normalise it, and so to say, you know, it's not unusual for blokes going through what you're going through mm -hmm. to think about suicide. So you're pulling it away from them and actually mm -hmm. saying this is a really normal thing for a bloke that's 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 going through whatever you're going through to to, to think about. So yeah. it just takes all the stigma and all the shame and all the all, all the 
weirdness away from it and enable enables the conversation to take place. And mm -hmm. I just want to check in um, that there's lots of great courses that go into much more detail about having this conversation. If you don't feel ready to have this conversation, mm -hmm. then that's OK, um, because there's lots of ways to get a little bit more training and help and support to do it. Yeah. Fantastic. So the big question that often comes up for a lot of people um, is, well, what if they say yes? And really at that point, I would say, we'll step back to the B in the ABC plan. Um, let's build a plan, but let's listen. So tell me more about what's brought you to this space. Why are you thinking along these lines? And just listen, we've got two ears, one mouth. We need to do twice as much listening as we do talking. And overwhelmingly, uh, our experience is that when people get a chance to actually offload how they're feeling, they start to feel better. Um, and, uh, you know, just the very fact that we're there in the space, willing to have that difficult conversation uh, reduces that sense of isolation. It helps people to stop feeling quite so alone and quite so isolated and stuck in their own, uh, in their own stuff. So, um, yes, you, if you are worried about what if they say yes, um, you know, as we, as Glenn said, we're, we're doing a very brief uh, introductory level conversation here, but I would say, you know, connect them with some other service. And the easy options would be something like Lifeline, Men's Line, Suicide Callback Service. Uh, obviously, they're all available 24-7. They've got online chat options as well so you don't have to be on the phone necessarily and we know some particularly younger people prefer that chat option so um, if nothing else give them a call together and say hey we've just been having this chat i'm worried about my friend here can you give us some guidance about what to do next and they can they can take over um, and, and 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 guide you through together how to uh, make some progress. So there's lots of other services obviously out there um, that meet the need um, relevant to specific issues. As we mentioned, the Doing a Tough website is there. Uh, most of these national organisations like Lifeline and Men's Line, they have service directories as well, uh, which would provide you with lots of resources to connect with as well. So we've really touched uh, very briefly on that difficult question. Does anybody want to ask anything more about that before we start to wrap up our session today? Let's stop and share there. So, um, okay, feel free to come off mute and ask a question if there are any more thoughts. Yes, there's been some great feedback in the, um, in, in the chat, really just deepening a lot of what you've said, um, Jonathan. Um, but yeah, if anyone's got a specific question they want to ask or any feedback uh, right now. Um, just some thanks. Great session. Super helpful. But as we're chatting, I'm just going to share a survey link in the chat box. It's great for us to get feedback. Really helps. Um, it only takes a couple of minutes. If you haven't got time now, click it open. So it's there uh, sitting in a tab ready to do uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, that's been fantastic, Jonathan. You've distilled so much. You know, the assist suicide prevention training takes two days. And um, Jonathan has condensed pretty much all of the key knowledge you get in that two day program into into one hour, um, whilst also um, focusing it in on the needs of men, which is an incredible uh, achievement. Uh, and it's been I found it incredibly uh, helpful, Jonathan. Uh, lots of great thanks in the uh, in the chat box here. Great session. Thanks, Russell. Thanks for all your contribution. Thanks, Colin. Um, good to see you again. You were here yesterday. Tim, thanks for your contribution. Thank you there. Thanks from Kai. That's great. Um, any final thoughts from you, um, Jonathan, if no one comes off mute? Because I know we're just about two minutes from one o'clock. So uh, we, yeah. we'll get 
getting close. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Graham. Go on. Just my last comment would be, don't forget to look after yourself. Um, you know, if you do have a conversation with someone uh, about suicide, um, find an opportunity to, to chat with a, a friend or a colleague to just offload, uh, you know, get in touch with a service organisation and, and check in with them and debrief a little bit, if you like, um, and get some fresh air, you know, go for a walk, go and do something a little extra for yourself uh, because what a great job you've done. Yeah. And look, we're going to keep the room open for a few minutes afterwards. So if anyone's uh, needing a chat, uh, either stick around, message us directly or um, drop us an email. I'll just give the uh, the general uh, email uh, for AHF. And if there's uh, uh, just to say, can I, can I have a call? Can I have a, can I have a chat if you want to use that? You don't have to give any details or information.